Hey, we're back for another episode of the MMA Perspective. We took a a two week hiatus instead of our regular. Well, I guess is it, is it a one week hiatus? I think it'd be a one week hiatus. I guess since we're always regularly out for a week. Um, I'm don't hold me to that. But anyway, um, yeah. So we weren't around last week. There wasn't a major MMA event, so it didn't really matter. I know, you know, you two were both locked into various familial obligations and or sexual exploits um stories repeatable stories things that no okay a gentleman never tells yeah <laughs> so, so get talking tom <laughs> you guys both have memoirs to write i'm sure later but uh <laughs> anyway we're here now to talk about UFC 185, maybe look at UFC 184 a little, maybe look at the, our middleweight scouting report, which is finally just about wrapped up to the point of being ready to publish, and um, maybe a little bit about a couple other prospects that have been fighting regionally as well. I think first off, though, we're going to dive right into 185, because that actually has a fair number of young fighters that are interesting and worth looking at, and that we are all excited to watch. Um, Tom, who are you most excited for this weekend? Uh, I mean, excited is a really strong word, isn't it? I mean, aside from the, the main I mean, I'm actually really pumped for this card. Obviously, the main event, co-main event, um, the whole main card is is looking really good. On, on the undercard, um, I'm always anyway, down for... A, Robbing hard on. That's what I want to know. Like, what what has you at full attention right now? Um, probably uh, seeing uh, Henry Cuejo get back in the cage, and um, hopefully, hopefully, I mean, we're doing this during the weigh-ins again, so you know. Who oh, knows? we already weighed in. Oh, we already weighed in. I already. I I am so bad about paying attention to weigh-ins. I'm the worst at it. Like, I I did not grow up a combat sports fan. And it's just, like, something totally foreign to me, even as I've been, like, a mar mixed martial arts fan for, like, I don't know, like, six years at this point. Um, but watching him work, I mean, he is one of the more exciting, I mean, like, not young fighters, but, like, prospects inside the UFC. And and I'm really hoping he kind of gets it together um, kind of as a fighter, as a professional, because he's got so much freaking talent that he could, whatever weight class he decides to fight in, um, he's going to bring a lot to it, and I'm always excited to see him get in the cage. So he's probably on the undercard, the one I'm most looking forward to. Um, aside from him, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, Jared Rochalt for no other factor than the the potential for an utter train wreck again. That's so nice of you. Yeah, I think uh, Cahuto is kind of a interesting special case in MMA and that he's a guy who I mean he's really like I, I mean he's fairly young I, I guess he's older than I thought for some reason I thought he was a lot younger I don't know why I guess he won the Olympic gold so young that I assumed that he was still that young yeah, he was um, only 21 when he won the gold medal yeah exactly and so I was like oh he must be like 23 or something now but no he's 28 but anyway, um, yeah. So for some reason, that never quite registered to me that he was all, that was like seven years ago. Um, but Cahuto, I think he's one of those guys that he's already like he's only two years into his MMA career, and fans are already like half of them are already totally writing them off him off, and the other half are. I don't know. Th I think there's a lot of over skepticism about his MMA career. Like, the idea that a guy who had enough drive to win an Olympic gold medal couldn't have enough drive to do well in MMA. I, I find that a little strange. It's this idea that, like, oh, you know, oh, his per his personality doesn't work hard enough and all that. It's like, yeah, he he hasn't, but it's, it's not like we don't know he can. We know that this kid is capable, or this guy is capable of working hard enough to be a champion in this sport. Yeah, I mean, Cejudo, like, there's anybody who's ever questioned his talent is just dead wrong. 
because he's unbelievably talented. He's an, he's an incredible athlete. He's obviously an awesome wrestler. Like, you don't win a gold medal in wrestling without being really good at wrestling. That should go without saying, but apparently some of our compatriots in the MMA fan sphere and blogosphere and media need to be reminded of that. No, Henry Cejudo is really, really, really good. Um, the question, and, and his actual performances, it, when, when you see him fight, um, even before he was in the UFC, his quote-unquote least impressive performances were still him just drubbing a dude for three rounds. A dude who's not that bad, uh, dudes who aren't that bad, so who does still just beat, beat the crap out of them. Um, so, I mean, if you were looking for him to just come out and look like a first-round destroyer of worlds, no, but it was clear that he was getting, he was getting cage time. Uh, in, in his early fights, and he was looking to work out some kinks and, and figure things out. The question has been, does he, does he want to put in the work to consistently get better past the point where he's relying on essentially his natural talent and his physical gifts? Um, a, that, and B, does he have the work ethic to make weight? Um, because that's in large part what, what making weight boils down to is can you, put your, can you be disciplined enough to put yourself through this for, you know, uh, for however long it takes to make the weight? Um, his last two fights, yeah, he's done both. Of, he's done both of those things. He made the weight today. I didn't think he looked bad on the scale based on the pictures that I saw. Um, he looked like he did it the right way. He looked like he had a good cut. Um, and if he's made the kind of, and if he's continued to be in the gym in the last couple of months, I I think there's every reason to assume he's going to look just awesome tomorrow. I mean, you know, poor Chris Carriazzo is just the B side of every matchup he's ever been in. Um, and and this is no different. Like if Cejudo if, if Cejudo comes out looking like he should, uh, then he's just going to run through that poor dude. Yeah, I think I think the reaction to Cejudo is kind of a case study for MMA fans. Missing weight it takes a long time to kind of shake off missing weight more than once. I, I think fans can be can forgive like one one time missing weight, but once it becomes a what once it becomes a thing for you, it follows you. I mean, we're still we still hear jokes about Rumble missing weight. I mean, there's still jokes. I mean, we we make we make them. Uh, and we're talking about a guy that was cutting down to welterweight who's fighting now comfortably at light heavyweight. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things where if if you miss weight consistently, even other fighters, other professionals start to view you as questioning your work ethic and. I mean, in, in the case of a guy like Cejudo, uh, when you hear from the wrestling community that he was always kind of he was always kind of like that. He was always kind of a little a little um, maybe like eccentric is the right word, but um, uh, it, it does lead to those questions. But it does seem like he has it on track, and when he's on, he just wrecks people. Well, I think the big thing to me is that, and this is just this is armchair psychology. So please, anybody who's who's already been listening, like, if you haven't tuned us out yet, now is the time. But um, is, is the idea, like, we know he had the worth, work ethic to win an Olympic gold medal. Like, we know the work ethic exists. This isn't like a, this isn't like Melvin Gillard, where you're sort of like, oh, well, what if he really did, you know, put it all together? Couldn't he be great at this sport? Or, you know, things like that. I mean, it's kind of like the BJ Penn thing, where people were always questioning BJ Penn's work ethic. It's like you, you realize he was a cha champion, right? Like, see, I, I don't like. I, I disagree with you, Zane, and I'll tell you why. Because showing that at one point in your life you can work hard in a sport where everybody works hard all the time, like there, that's that's not the same thing at all. I mean, like Cejudo. So Cejudo, yeah, he worked really hard in the lead up to the 2008 Olympics and he basically rolled out of bed 3 week, 3 months before the the 2012 Olympic trials and was like okay yeah let's see let's see how yeah. I can. he did and, like and, nothing and, for like 3 years and and i think so the second part of that point is that i would be much wor more worried about him when he gets on a real r real run of success and has people really excited about him when he's like starting to headline cards or starting to get like on the main cards trying to get that He's already on the main card, but when he's starting to get like a real push and a real fan base and a lot of money out of MMA and a lot of success out of MMA, that's when I'd start to worry about him. Like I think coming up, he had that feeling like, oh, I'm already going to be champ, I'm already going to be great, and so he wasn't working hard. And now he's hit that wall where suddenly in the UFC, like there is a lot more expectation. People will get on you really hard for these minor, mis you know, these missing weight and all that kind of stuff that regional promoters were willing to kind of forgive and push aside and be like, oh, no, 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 it's still okay. We'll get you the fight and we'll get you, you know, whatever. 
And so, like, I could see him having trouble maintaining that work ethic down the road, but I think, like, right now, I don't know that it's going to be a problem. I think people are looking for a problem that... I could see it being a big dish issue later on. Like, if he ever held the belt, I would be very... Like, that would be a point where I'd be like, oh my god, I can't... I don't know that I would trust him to work hard while holding the belt. It would see, like, people said exactly the same thing before he debuted in the UFC, that, like, oh, this time Cejudo will, will get it together. Like, he's got to realize what a big deal this is. Like, he can't miss weight for his first fight in the UFC, you know. He must have buckled down for this. And then he had a... T he, like, didn't put in the work. He had a terrible cut and and was pulled from that card the, the, the day of the weigh-ins. Like, the... I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to it. I think it's just, like, you can never count on a guy who has a documented track record of like, just not giving a shit for long periods of time. I mean, that's, I, I don't know, I, I don't I don't see any way of predicting when Henry Cejudo will or will not give a shit. Like, and that's that's the problem with him. Like, that, that's, I, I, that's true. I guess I, I see it, like, sort of like the Rampage thing, though, for me, where, like, a lot has been made of how hard Rampage works or doesn't work, but, like, over the long haul, and, yeah, he couldn't maintain as a champ, but over the long haul, he's still been generally a pretty decent fighter, and I, I kind of wonder if we're going to see that. You know, we're going to see all the same screw-ups, but we're not going to see this, like, total career fall apart that a lot of people are worried about. I don't, yeah, I don't think it'll ever be that. I think it's just, like, will Cejudo get up for X fight, or Y fight, or Z fight? Yeah. I, don't know. I mean... Every 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 sport has athletes like that, majorly talented, but you just never know mentally where they're at on any given day. Yeah, like look at Miguel Cabrera in baseball, like where he had such a drinking problem that there was a documented difference between his performance in day games versus <laughs> night games. That was a thing that you could predict because he would be hung over as shit for day games. Like with Cejudo, where it's like, well, will he just not come to the gym for a couple of months or, or three months? I don't know. But at any rate, I mean. Like, I think all signs appear to be there that for this fight, Cejudo's head is in the game, and if that's the case, then Chris Carriazzo is going to be in enormous trouble. Yeah. Relatively quickly. I, I, I think he... I, I guess I, I would at least say this, that he has enough natural talent that even when he doesn't show up, he'll probably win half those fights. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's probably part of the problem. Yeah. Especially, yeah. yeah. especially at flyweight, which is a division that, lest we forget, has Louis Smolka ranked in the top fifty, like comfortably in the top fifteen. Yeah. So take that as you will. I mean, no offense to Louis Smolka, but like Louis Smolka, man. <laughs> <laughs> All like, right. So we 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 we've, we've ridden Cejudo into the ground firmly. Uh, Wyman, who are you looking forward to on this card? Irish Joe Duffy. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think that um, <clears throat> he's a different prospect. I think than what he's being than what he's being made out to be a little bit. Um, he's he's really good at everything. Uh, there's no area of his game where he's got a real uh, deficiency. Um, I think that he could actually look a little rougher than expected here because he spent this camp working with Faraz Zahabi, and Zahabi wants to break dudes down and then rebuild them. So if this is a consistent relationship, or if this is fixing to be a consistent relationship, then in a couple of fights, Duffy could look like a monster. This one, he could look a little rough as he's getting used to a whole different system and way of doing things. Like, um, But with that said, I, I think they're... Actually, I don't know, because they're, the way that Duffy approaches fights is pretty cerebral and pretty uh, um, pretty measured, and that should, that should fit right away with what Zahabi wants to do, but... Um, at any rate, like, Duffy is a dude. He's got professional boxing experience. He's a good striker. I don't think he's, like, he, he's not a lights-out, absolute killer on the feet where he's going to knock you out with one shot, but he's got really, really good timing. He's got really good sense of the distance. He's hard to hit cleanly. Um, like, a lot of, uh, I mean, he's not going to, he's never going to bomb you with, with a single punch. That's not, that's not his game. Um, and he's not even really, like, a, a combination striker. He'll maybe put together a couple of shots, but really he's kind of an outfighter. Um, he wants to hit and not get hit. He's very good at it. Um, if he's going to knock you out, it's going to be because you duck into something that he throws, and he'll set you up for that. But he's not, like, he's not a bomber. Um, but I'm mostly just struck by how solid he is everywhere. 
Like, there's nothing that he doesn't know how to do. He's a plus athlete, if not, like, a super outstanding one. Um, he knows how to uh, he, he knows how to fight against good quality competition. He's got a lot of experience against guys who are really good. Uh, I mean, he's the kind of dude who, who could be who could easily be a top fifteen lightweight in, in two or three fights. Um, I think he's certainly got the talent for that. And in a stacked division, that's not a mean feat by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm just I'm really stoked for him. I think that there's a lot to like there. He's uh, he's just. He's different. He's a he's a different breed of prospect than most of what we're getting because he's got so much more experience and so much more polish. Like he's not a oh we've got to bury this guy on the fight pass prelims for three fights while he develops. He's like this dude will be ready for a main card slot in his next fight. Yeah, yeah. I actually um, I'm I'm looking forward to him as well. I think I think uh, TriStar's a really good fit for him for the reasons that you said, Pat. Uh, he he approaches fighting in a way similar to the way Faraz does, so I think that's going to jive very well. It also helps that he's fighting Jake Lindsay, uh, who isn't exactly a world beater, so I, I expect Duffy to look quite good in this. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see him get out there, because I think I, I would agree with you. I think he's he's one of the more... He's kind of like a throwback prospect. He's, he's a guy coming in that's closer to being a finished product than we're used to being kind of making his debut on on a fight pass portion or an undercard portion of a card. Yeah, I have to say at least one thing that I'm happy about is actually him taking three years off, I think, has actually probably been a really good thing for him and is something that I continue to think is not the worst idea for young fighters to do, especially guys who get started um, at a relatively young age. I mean, I think he was probably... About 20 when he started, which isn't that young, but you know it, it's now like three years off, and he's come back strong, and he could still like that kind of time away could do him some good. It could kind of slow down his career a bit for somebody who's already been in the sport a while and has fought a lot. You know, fought a lot at a reasonably high level. So I'm definitely interested in that. Um, and yeah, he's. I think honestly, he's got a walkover fight. So I don't know how rough he can look against Jake Lindsay. Like, I mean, Lindsay's got the definition of a puncher's chance. Lindsay's got bricks for fists he does. And, and very and very little else. I mean, he's actually. I mean, it's an interesting matchup, and it's actually you know props to Joe Silva for putting this fight together because it's the perfect kind of test for a dude like Duffy, where. You know his uh, Lindsay's limitations are clear. Like he's got bad, he's got bad cardio. He's not terribly technical, and he's super hittable. Um, but you know he's but he hits really hard, and he's got a really good inside game. And Duffy is a very defined out fighter. Like he very much wants to be either all the way out or you know wrestling on mm -hmm. the inside. He doesn't like, he doesn't like to be exchanging in the pocket at all. So if his footwork's not on point, if his sense of the distance isn't on point. Um, if his if his clinch game isn't on point, or at least his ability to break and, and create distance, if that's not on point, then Lindsay's going to make it a rough night for him, and then we'll know something about Joseph uh, about Joseph Duffy. Uh, it's it's true. I think that Lindsay's foot, foot foot slow for that though. I, that's I, yeah. No, I'm I'm just saying like the I understand the the purpose of the mat of the yeah. matchmaking. Like it's perfect matchmaking to see where Duffy's really at. Like if. If he comes out and he really struggles with that, then okay, maybe he's not as polished as we thought, and we dial it back, and you know we don't like look to make a push for him in the Irish market because it's kind of an underrated thing about Duffy to to get beyond his actual skills. He's the only guy the UFC has on the roster from Ireland who's, I mean, he, you know, Park is from Northern Ireland, so that doesn't count. But like within their like the Republic of Ireland, their Irish market. Uh, Duffy is the only dude they've signed who's not from the Greater Dublin area. Like, mm. he's, so it, not like they're not like the UFC is sitting down, coming up with a lot of slide, uh, like a lot of PowerPoint presentations about how to crack the rural Irish market. Um, <laughs> but, but like, no, I mean, he's like a Donegal guy. He's from, he's not from he's not from Dublin, and like he's he's a way of getting those people excited. So like you could you could see that there's a, they could put a push behind him to, to reach basically the rest of Ireland, aside from Dublin. Um, but if he's not that guy, then you need to know that right away, and Lindsay, and, and Lindsay will tell you that if he's not that guy. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it, it, it's, it's one of those fights that I, I hope to see and should see. We should see Duffy just kind of showcase and yeah. really show off and look great. Um, 
I think the one of the fights I'm honestly really interested in, not because and, and this I, I'm interested in it because I expect it could be actually pretty ugly, is Elias Theodoru versus Roger Narvaez. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested to see if there's any chance it won't be pretty ugly. Because it would be really nice to see one of them show up and really show something good enough to take that fight over. Well, Theodoru is going to beat the shit out of Narvaez, man. Like, just just beat the crap out of him. Like, he better. Well, yeah, but I'm, but there's no chance it's not ugly. But I, I, I talked to Theodoru about this because, you know, I, I wanted to get a sense for why he likes to fight the way that he does and where he learned to do it. Um, and Theodoru... He takes pride in fighting ugly, believe it or not. Like he wants to be, he wants to beat dudes up, um, and he wants to beat dudes up. He wants to make them uncomfortable. And I think he's operating kind of under the assumption that, like, as time goes on, his game will get more aesthetically pleasing. And it, and he's he's like, well, I'm charismatic enough for now that like people will want to watch me fight, even if it's not like a pretty kind of thing. Um, like, I, I was really impressed by him. He's got a re- he's really self aware. He's got a good sense yeah. of who he is and what he wants to do in there. But the, but like if we're looking at the matchup, um, Theodore is not going to fuck around with Narvaez at range any more than he has to. Narvaez doesn't have a good clinch game, so he's going to bull into the pocket and into the clinch, beat him up there, take him down, and beat him up from top position. Like no, there's no chance it's not ugly because that's what Theodore wants to do, and he actually kind of embraces that. Yeah, it's I true. would. I, I would agree with that. I, I think Theodore is going to be more than ready for everything Navarez has. Um, beat him up inside, take him down. I don't think he's going to be that worried about Navarez on the ground. Um, I, I I heard it on this on this show. Um, uh, what was it called? The MMA Rounds. Pat, have you heard of that thing? I, I have not. Huh? Could you could you fill me in on it a little bit? The guy who runs it's a real jerk, but he got some interesting interviews. Um, and uh, I believe Theodoro spent he spent his training camp down with Team Noguera. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and. <laughs> <laughs> spent spent a ton of time uh, spent a ton of time working. I, I I would expect for the reason that Navarez I think he feels Navarez's real way to win this fight is is through ground grappling. I expect this to be an inside fight against the cage, for it to get really nasty and for it to go to the ground and be kind of a, a grind out by Theodoru. And if Navarez kind of cardio breaks for it to be a stoppage. Yeah, I think my only concern at all would be that um, Theodore has never really fought someone who not only is looking to, but could even potentially strike with him at range. Like, you know, he's fought guys that aren't good, and then he fought Bruno Santos and Sheldon Westcott, who are both clinch fighters by nature. And Narvaez, like he he showed a lot of improvement in his kickboxing last time out. I, I don't know. I don't think it'll be enough for him to win. But I do want I do want to see more. Like, you know, I, I'm glad that Theodoru has really embraced the idea that to make his game ugly or like to have a really ugly game that will improve over time. But I do wonder if there isn't a chance that he'll end up getting stuck against some guys. Maybe Narvaez won't be the guy, but. Um, you know. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't think Narvaez is that dude. Like, Narvaez is not actually like a bad fighter by by any stretch of the imagination. Like, he's a, he's a good like depth guy for for the UFC to have in that division. Um, he's he's pretty he's competent everywhere. But like, even if this turns into a like a pure range striking battle, he's still gonna be uh, he, he's still way outclassed in terms of power and speed and athleticism, and maybe even technical skill. Like. Theodoru is not at this point in his career like a world beater range, but his physical gifts are so much are, are are pretty outstanding. And in that case, I still think you would have to take him over Narvaez. Even in a he also has a, a Theodoru also has a Muay Thai fights in Thailand on his record. Um, no, it's, I, like I said, I'm not picking Narvaez to win. I could just see this being one of those ugly range point kickboxing middleweight bouts that we all know and love. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, I I just think that like I, I'm a I'm a Theodora believer. I, I will I will say that. I think he's yeah. the brightest thing the UFC's got coming up at, at one eighty five outside of the, the top fifteen or so. Um, yeah, and the, the, that middleweight be, division's ugly as hell, so I don't doubt that. Yeah, and I mean but he's also got kind of he's also got real charisma and he's got a good sense of who he is, he's got a good head on his shoulders. Um, I mean, if in the sense that we're looking for that in combat sports, I should say. 
Um, I mean, he's 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 a charming dude. He's an engaging dude. Uh, he's smart for MMA. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I mean, I, no I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> no, I mean he's he's smart in general, but like he's he's got that kind of like okay personal brand. Like he's got a degree in creative advertising, and so like selling himself yeah. as an MMA property is a natural progression for him. No, uh, I, I know the dude. Dude's got a Twitter account for his hair. I mean, that's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, I think he had that set up like the day he got off tough. He had like a Twitter account set up for his hair. I mean, oh, he absolutely did. It's and a I, man I, I, love, I love Yeah. That. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, I actually am sold on him as a. Yeah, talent. no, it's great. Like, um, and I, I mean, I think he beats up Roger Narvaez. I think he, yeah, he could absolutely run into trouble against the top ten or so. But like, he, you know, when we're talking about the dregs of the middleweight division, sorry, Roger Narvaez. Like, uh, he, Theodore was just kind of on another level. Have we lost Zane? Hello. Ooh, we Zane. might have lost Zane. I think we may have lost Zane. Let's. Uh, uh, so. Okay. No, okay, I'm here. Oh, there he is. Hello? Yeah. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yep, we got you. Well, we, okay. We? All right. <laughs> this is fantastic listening. Uh, okay, I'm going to close some windows here. All right. This uh, is genius. Well, as I say, well, you want to do that. Uh, I all want, right. I very much Are want to talk about Are we getting any Jared better himself. at all? Wait, what? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Okay. okay. We're back. Tom would okay. like to talk about Jared Rocheld. Yeah. The only one we would like to talk about Jared Rocheld. So let's talk about Jared Rocheld. Well, I-, I said my favorite thing about Jared Rocheld is that if he's going to do something, like if he's going to hit a brick wall in a fight, he is going into it like full speed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that is what his last fight showed me that he's going to make a mistake he he is 100% committing to that mistake um and that aside it's heavyweight and he's a pretty good wrestler he's going to have time to kind of get get his real get a feel for MMA even if it's going to take him a while um i actually think that he he's going to be in the UFC heavyweight division for for a while he may not be a, a standout fighter i don't think he's really going to kind of break into that I mean, the top 15 for heavyweight is not really ever out of reach for anyone on the roster, but I think there is there is a ceiling in, in heavyweight. It tends to be around, like, 8 or 7 where you actually get into the guys who are who are really quite talented and good fighters. Uh, I don't know if he ever makes it there, but I think he definitely has the skills to kind of hang around and be, like, that middle-range heavyweight in the UFC. And I think Josh Copeland is... Um, here to make it seem like Jared Rochelle is already at that level. I, I, I kind of feel like I kind of feel like Copeland is being brought in to, to kind of give another prospect kind of a, a, a cage time match. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that Copeland is that bad. All things uh, all things considered, from a skills perspective, like hey, he's a really mechanically sound puncher. Um, the problem is he's just so badly out of shape, like the. And, and I mean, not not in terms of his cardio per se, but like he's he's pretty quick already. Think about how much quicker he'd be if he weren't carrying around probably twenty five or thirty pounds that he didn't need. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, and I don't say that as, as I'm not like trying to fat shame the dude or anything like that. But like, if your game rely if you're a short kind of stocky heavyweight and your game relies on you kind of leaping in and out of punching distance as Copeland's does then being able to do that more quickly than you can right now would be a would be a pretty substantial benefit right like i mean i'm i like i'm i'm just saying purely from that perspective but like one thing that kind of interests me about this fight and i'm not saying that i think copeland's going to win and i i cuz i don't but one thing that makes this a really interesting matchup from where i'm standing is that rocheholt is not a range striker you know he's not going to pot shot you on the outside he wants to be uh, I mean, he wants to strike into the clinch and strike into his takedown attempts. And a sharp uh, striker uh, could could pick him off as he comes in and as he tries to use his strikes to set up uh, to set up his level changes and to set up uh, and to set up his clinch entries. So if Copeland is sharp on that front, he could really crack Rocheholt on on his way in. Um, now the problem is, 
you know, Copeland is not going to be able to stuff Rocheholt for very long, if at all. I would expect it to be kind of a grinding fight where Rocheholt is using the top right a lot. And he's, he's punching Copeland as he tries to scramble back to his feet. More than one in which, like, he's just controlling from top position. I think it's going to be kind of an ugly fight, and I, I just want to point out that, like, Copeland has one hitter quitter kind of power, um, and Rocheholt at this point, it seems fairly clear, does not have, like, a super great chin, in addition to being not real defensively sound. Um, so take that as you will. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, th- this is about, I think my reaction to this is similar to your reaction to Theodore Narvaez, in that, like, I understand the idea that Copeland could be potentially somehow competitive, but I don't see it at all. Yeah. Like, I, I, unless Rochalt just forgot everything that he knows how to do in there, I think he's just going to take Copeland down and rough him up and take him down and rough him up and take him down and rough him up. Because, I mean, Copeland is, yeah, I think physically, like, the physical tools for him are there, but the consistency with which he can strike is not there to the point that somebody like Rochalt is going to get hit hard enough once to get knocked out or, and, and or, you know, get hit hard enough to get hurt and then have Copeland be able to stay on him and keep hurting him. You know, he, he might hit, hit him once hard, but then he's going to end up being chasing him with, his, you know, kind of ugly footwork or getting taken down, and, like, he just doesn't have all the ability to keep things consistent and mm-hmm. actually ma- take advantage of the skills that he has at this point. It, it kind of makes me, I don't know, I, I don't like the way that the UFC is necessarily matching up their heavyweight division, in that they seem to be high, high, finally getting some good prospective fighters in there, but they're they don't really know which ones are the guys that need to be developed and which ones are the guys that should just be feeders. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, they do seem to finally be getting a sense for that with uh, with the lighter weight classes. Maybe it's just a Shelby yeah. versus Silva kind of thing um, because you can see Shelby doing that with guys like Aljamain Sterling and Tomas Almeida. Like, okay, we're going to give them a step-up matchup, but it's a step-up matchup that, fa- that, that really works in their favor. Like Yves Jabouin versus Tomas Almeida, right? Like that's a fight that, like, it's a challenge and it's a it's a big step up in competition. But like, it's one where Almeida should get to fight his kind of fight. Uh, same deal with Mitsugaki and with Mitsugaki Sterling. Um, but with a fight like this, like Copeland is is a dude who could potentially provide some depth to that division and he could hang around the fringes of the top fifteen. But instead, you give him two really solid prospects instead of matching him up with like a not great veteran. Like, yeah, I I, I get where you, I, I get where you're coming from, Zane. I, yeah, I think like they, you know, it's like um, like you bring they bring in guys like you know Tony Johnson, I think his name is, or is is it Tony I Johnson? Tony Johnson. Tony Johnson is a different dude. Oh, who who is it? Timothy Johnson. I, yeah, Timothy Johnson. Timothy Johnson. They bring in guys like Timothy Johnson, and Timothy Johnson's never gonna develop. Like that's not a fighter that's going someplace, or Ron Potts. Mm-hmm. You know, these are guys that, are, or for that matter, I mean, Anth- you know, Anthony Hamilton is another guy that, like, yeah, he had a little promise, but it became pretty quickly apparent that, like, it just wasn't going to develop. And then you have guys like, um, oh, who who is that uh, guy, that, that small heavyweight they brought in from Alaska recently? Jared Cannonier. Yeah, like Cannoneer, like Copeland, like, yeah. and, and, you know, and guys like that. And it's just like, we're just going to throw them into some, some, you know, throw them in against some of the guys, like some really tough, long-time heavyweights that are really going to be challenging. And they're going to be fodder for these guys that we already know aren't going to get over, but can beat really unskilled guys. For now, it's like we we already kind of know that Jared Rochalt is never going to be a top five heavyweight. He's never going to be a title challenger. But now we're just you know, so we're using Copeland to build Rochalt. Like, why why are we getting that instead of seeing like Rochalt versus uh, oh, Sean Jordan or somebody like that? You know, it's like let these guys fight each other. We don't you know we're not building Sean Jordan anymore. Yeah, yeah. Or so like. Uh... 
Uh, I mean, we already saw Rochelle versus Soa Palele, but, but yeah, I mean, guys, guys like that where it's clear what the ceiling is, or with yeah. Stefan Struve now, like, it should be clear that Stefan Struve is never, is never getting over to that level. But you give those guys a chance to win three fights in a row against similar competition, and then maybe they surprise you when they get that matchup with a top 15 guy or, or what have you. Um, yeah. Like, I don't know. It, it's Heavyweight is just so weird. It's yeah. such a weird class where, with so little talent. Yeah. It it is. Um, it, it's it's the mystery spot of MMA. It, it's it's yeah. like weird area where all the laws of physics are, you know, tilted in strange ways that don't make any sense and guys guys suddenly become title contenders fifteen years into their career regularly. Yeah. Squadrons of airplanes just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm I'm really curious about this the, the prospect I, w- I wanted to talk about because I don't really have a good read on her. Uh, uh, Larissa Pacheco. What are your guys' thoughts? I was gonna I was actually gonna bring her up in the same context because I haven't had okay. a chance to watch I, her a lot. So I, 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 I have a beat on her. She is two things that make her incredibly difficult to handle in women's MMA for the majority of the competition she faces and yet not that well equipped for the UFC. Okay. She's big and she's aggressive. Mm-hmm. And she's when I say aggressive, like she's one of those fighters, like she she's a lot like Jessica Andrade in that like just really aggressive everywhere at times to a total fault. Except mm-hmm. Pacheco that I would even say is more aggressive. And Unlike a lot of the talent that they get in for women's MMA, you know, she's 5'8". She's actually pretty big. Like, she's a pretty tall woman. Most most women, even at bantam weight, are not quite that tall. We see a lot of women who are like, like Andrade is 5'2", you know, or like 5'4". Um, thing is that she is not, A, she's not, doesn't have any part of her game that's technical. Like, she's got a decent scrambling jiu-jitsu game, and she is really aggressive with her strikes, but she doesn't train at any kind of big camp. And it's all just kind of a mishmash. It's one of those things you see out of a lot of big ca- of small camp fighters where, like, they've obviously spent a lot of time doing everything, but not all of it is near is with good technique, mm-hmm. and none of it fits together. And so she's big and she's aggressive and that's kind of it right now. If she goes to a better camp, they could maybe turn that into something, kind of unlock her, the the height of her athletic potential because I think that's the big question is how high is that potential because Andrade just trucked her. Yeah, I mean, Andrade is, like, that was just such a brutal matchup for Pacheco. I remember talking about it on Twitter with John Anik when those odds came out and somehow, like, Pacheco opened as the favorite, and then yeah. a bunch of money came in on Andraj, and then a bunch of money came in on Pacheco again. And I'm like, is there something that I'm missing here? Like, what am I like? What am I not seeing about this? That it, it, it was really it was really confusing. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I was I was curious as to what you thought of her because that tracks fairly neatly with my own assessment. I mean, I've watched the, I've watched the film. It's just like it's hard for me to put it together into any sort of coherent kind of narrative about who she is and what she's doing. Um, I mean, I, I have her over over Deronomy here for a variety of reasons. Deronomy is not is, is fairly old. Uh, she doesn't really have anything to speak of as a game aside from her kickbox aside from her kickboxing and clinch. Um, she doesn't throw very much, which is a which is a real problem. Um, so my thought is that Pacheco could just beat her on work rate. Um, yeah. Like that's that's kind of my read of it. Is like Durand, like like Julie Kedzie, uh, God bless her, is not like a real high output fighter, and she kept that fight really close just because she kept working. You know. Um, it, yeah, I, I'm I'm going with Durand to me just because I I don't know just because I, I like the odds that everybody's picking Pacheco as the favorite, and I think that she could be one of those. Not obviously nearly to the degree of Alexis Dufresne, but still one of those women who, like, we're talking about some serious skill deficits that are just not getting made up in any time quickly, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'll say this. The difference between Pacheco and and Dufresne is, like, A, Pacheco's a a much better athlete. Yeah. um, And just, like, an unspeakably better athlete. Yeah. Uh, B... 
uh, Pacheco, unlike uh, unlike uh, um, Christ, I Dufresne. Just his name, Dufresne. Uh, Pacheco, unlike Dufresne, actually beat real competition before yeah. she before she made it to the UFC. Like uh, like Pacheco's win over Irene Aldana is like like that's a legit win. I mean, Irene yeah. Aldana is is probably one of the two or three best women's bantamweight prospects out there outside outside the UFC. Um, so there's so she's got that. Uh, but I don't. I don't think you're wrong at all, man. I mean, like Pacheco really does need to spend more time at a bigger camp, and she needs to like. Hey, yeah, she's got to get stuff figured out. But then again, you know, she's only. I think she's only twenty or twenty-one. Like, yeah, she's really young. Like, it, would just be, it, it would be good to see her go to a camp like the Black Zillions, some place that's just gonna strip her game down and say, okay, let's start over. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Even some place like Team Nogara would be like a yeah. massive step up for her, but but I don't know. We'll see. Um, it, it's certainly an interesting fight. I mean, it's, it, is. Uh, it it could be it could be really boring if they run to me just kind of grinds her, um, or it could be or it could be just kind of a barn burner too. I'm I'm hoping for the latter. I think the latter seems more likely to me. Yeah, we'll see. Th- that'll be an interesting one. Uh, so I think the only other person I want to take a look at at all, really, on this card um, is Joanna Yandrechik, uh, as she's a prospect. I mean, she hasn't been fighting that long, and she's pretty fucking amazing for somebody who hasn't been fighting that long. Yeah, she's she's really good. Um, I would be absolutely picking her to win this fight if it were a year from now. But I think that inexperience is going to be a real problem for her here, because I, and this is something Connor and I talked about on on heavy hands a little bit. But like her unwillingness to kick is is going to be a real problem in this matchup where she needs because she's a very linear fighter. You know, she uh, she wants to be moving mostly mostly in straight lines, uh, and she wants people to stand in front of her. But against high level competition, high level competition isn't going to stand in front of you just because you want them to. Um, and it helped when she fought Claudia Gadelia. Gadelia is a pretty linear fighter too. Um, Esparza is very much the opposite. Esparza is a quintessential circular circular movement. Wants to be out, wants to be outsider all the way in kind of fighter. That I think that's going to be tough for Yandrechek to deal with because she really relies on you standing um, in her wheelhouse to get off her punching combinations. She doesn't chase very well. Um, she doesn't it, like that's not really her wheelhouse. So you, so. In this kind of matchup, if you're Yandrechek, you need to use kicks to cut off their escape angles and force them and force them to stand uh, and force them to stand more or less in front of you and to push them back towards the cage too, because kryptonite for an outfighter is to have your back to the ropes or to have your back to the fence. Um, so, but but Yandrechek's unwillingness to kick I think has a lot to do with how raw she is because you know she can throw kicks yeah. like if she was a kickboxer she knows how to fucking kick, um, but. You know, it, it's which is a pet peeve of mine in MMA. It's like just dress up your kicks and pull your head offline. Like you don't, you don't need to not kick and trust your single leg defense. And Andrejcek has great single leg defense. But I digress. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean Andrejcek is really, really good. She's got beautiful combination punching. She's she's an organic striker. Um, yeah. If that if that makes sense, you know she. She's not. Uh, she's not rote. She's not mechanical with the way that she throws her combinations. She has a real gift for understanding how to work around your defense, around and through your defense. Uh, so, like the the uppercut that she floored Claudia Gadelia with was beautiful, because she noticed that Gadelia was pulling her hands to the side to defend hooks, which left the middle completely open. And so, what she do? She sneaks an uppercut right in there, or and and she creates. Her openings. She doesn't just exploit openings. She creates them with her strike selection, which is that's a really, really, really high level skill to have for somebody who's only been competing professionally in MMA for a couple of years. Um, so high on her, but I just think this is a tough matchup, a lot tougher matchup than people are giving her credit for. Yeah, I, there's a lot to like about Yandrasek, but I think the things that stand out to me. I mean, obviously, the Pat you point out, she's she's a really fantastic striker, has a really good sense of when and how to land, which is something that when you see some when you see a fighter that young in their career, who just seems to have a sense for how to hit their target, uh, and you know, it doesn't really matter like what what kind of strike it is or the angle that they're at, that they they just manage to find their target with power. That's a good sign. Uh, the concerning things for me are, as you point out, she's very linear. She's not super great at preventing the clinch. 
She doesn't angle off great. She ends up tied up. It took her a little while to kind of find her legs against Gedalia. And in the Gedalia fight, almost every single takedown came off of cage wrestling. I, I really question her cage wrestling. Um, she's really good at kind of defending the shots out in the middle of the cage. As you point out, she has very nice uh, single leg defense. But if you kind of tie her up and drive her to the cage and make it a, a longer takedown exchange where you can kind of climb up to a body lock, uh, I think Esparza is going to have a lot of success taking her down there. And Yandrechek doesn't really bounce up off the mat. Um, she can. She did against Gedalia at times, but she also got held down for long periods of time, and Esparza just doesn't give you space. Uh, well, I, so I, I really feel that this ends up being, um, for a lot of people who are kind of like getting behind Yandrechek, I think this is going to be something of a disappointing showing for her, but I also don't think it's going to derail her as a prospect. As I said, as Pat said, I think she would have a much, much better chance if this fight was happening a year from now. I think the only thing I worry about with Yunjay Trick, really, if I'm getting right down to it, is, I mean, beyond the, you know, inexperience and things that will come with that, um, is honestly, this. I just wonder if she's maybe ever going to be kind of strong enough to really keep grinding wrestle grapplers off of her and from making fights close and ugly. And just the raw strength, because I think, honestly, like, her, you know, her technical... Everything she does technically, she does really well. You know, it's like when she sets herself to do something, her technique is always on point. Her takedown defense is always, you know, really smooth and consistent, and she does all the right things. But sometimes, you know, people like Esparza and like Gedelia, who are just these super powerful athletic freaks, can push through that, can just you know, run through your technique, especially because, you know, like you say, she is a linear fighter. She does want to be right in front of you. Have Wanting to be right in front of somebody who can overpower you can, especially in this sport, be problematic. So, yeah, I, that was eventually, like, I, I was pretty consistently thinking about taking Yandrichik as the underdog um, pick here, but eventually watching some more video on Carla Esparza and just how well she moves through the double leg, it's hard to see that and think of Yandrechik being able to consistently stop that. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I look for here um, is the way that, is the difference in the way that their two games layer together over time. Like, Yandrechik, uh, she's got all these skills and they work together really well and she's very tactical in terms of how she puts things together from moment to moment in a fight. Um, but strategically, like, I don't think that there's really multiple levels to understanding her game. Like, what you see is pretty much what you get. It's very it's very technical. It's very good. Um, whereas Esparza's game really, really builds on itself over time, a, a lot like Frankie Edgar's does. I've used this comparison a lot. But, like, the way that Esparza fights... You know, she's using something that she does in the first round to set up stuff that she's going to do in the second round, which sets up stuff that she's going to do in the third round, and so on, so so on, and so forth. Especially with the way that she chains her takedowns and the way that she'll just give up on a takedown in order to land three or four shots. The way that she controls transitional spaces, I think, is just going to be really hard for somebody who doesn't have a ton of experience uh, to deal with, and somebody who like as good a wrestler as Gadelia is. She's a very she's a very solid MMA wrestler. But she doesn't have a real deep technical wrestling repertoire in the same sense that somebody like Esparza does. I think, and again, I think that's going to be tough for for Yandrechek to deal with. So um, I, I, I like Yandrechek a lot, though. I think she's she's going to be. I think she will be the champion at some point in that division. Yeah, it could easily. I mean, we could be talking five years from now. She could be the champion with how young she is in the sport. You yeah. know. Um. I, oh, and we forgot about Sergio Pettis. I mean, I don't know. He's kind of like the soup du jour prospect, you know, it's sort of, everybody's having him. Um, I, I don't really know, like, how deep, like, I want to get into that, other than that he should beat Ryan Benoit, or Benoit, because he's from Texas. Um, but Benoit's probably the first guy that is as athletic as Pettis that they've put in front of him. He's really a good, fast-twitch, high-level, high-scrambling athlete, but just his technical game is not there. So I think my only yeah, concern... He throws a great left hook, and that's about it. 
Yeah. My, my only concern is that if Pettis gets caught early the way he did against Matt Hobar, uh, ben, Benoit is probably better set to really take advantage of that early. Yeah, like this is it's an interesting fight and it's not an easy fight for for Pettis at, at 125 making his UFC debut there. Like um I guess I, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm a little higher than than most people are on Sergio Pettis. I don't I don't know why that is, but I I really like his game. I think he's got a he's he's got a much different game than his brother does. It's a much more process oriented kind of uh, kind of approach. Uh, he throws a lot more volume. He's got a much better work rate. Uh, he throws really, he throws really nice combinations. Uh, I really like what he does in terms of uh, in in terms of throwing kicks in tight spaces, that which actually is something that his brother does. But I think Sergio might actually do it even better. He's really, really good at changing the arc of his kicks mid kick to land it, to land from odd angles and and uh, and from really close distances where you wouldn't expect him to. It's sneaky. Uh, it's probably his best tool. Um, and it's the kind of thing that's only going to get better with time. Um, you know, as far as him getting dropped consistently, though, that's got to be a concern, right? That you're yeah. that you're pretty you're a pretty young dude. He's fairly sound defensively, um, but getting but I mean, he's gotten dropped what two or three times in his first four UFC fights. Like that's not good, man. Like that probably shouldn't be happening. Yeah, I, I wonder if that comes down to a bit of. I don't know. I I don't know even know if gun shyness would be the right word, but it's just that like maybe that you know even when you necessarily see when you see the strike coming and you're set up for it properly, you still freeze in the moment and you know he puts himself in a position to get hit really hard even when he knows what he's doing and what's coming. So he's he's one, he's one of these dudes. Like I, I've got a theory about this that there's a certain class of guys. Who are actually very good defensive fighters when they when they get into a rhythm like like to, like compare the first and the second round when Tomas Almeida fought Tim Gorman like Gorman was lighting him up with just a jab in the first round by the second round I think Gorman landed one or two jabs the entire round um, yeah. and Pettis is super hittable early but once he finds his timing and his rhythm and everything like he's very good defensively he's really hard oh, yeah. to hit cleanly once you get into the once you get into the second and the third but for that first like minute and a half or two minutes. Like, you can just crack away at will on Sergio Pettis or Tomas Almeida or uh, Conor McGregor's like this to a, le- to a much lesser extent. It takes McGregor a lot less time to, to find himself. But, like, we're just – there's, like, a – you've got an opening for, like, two, three, four minutes where you can, where you can really put a hurting on them if they're, if they're not sharp. Yeah, well, Cerrone is, was the classic of that. I mean, he, he it's something that he, too, has worked to fix over time, but – it's just a thing that some guys... I mean, it's the classic slow starter idea. Um, yeah. So, I, I, I think, you know, there wasn't a lot to talk about from UFC 184 going backward. I mean, Holly Holmes kind of been played to death that we now know that she, you know... we it, For those who didn't know, everybody now knows that she's not a future Ronda Rousey title challenger even if she's a few, even if she becomes a content even if she contends for the title she's not going to challenge for it um and other than that yeah. Alan Joban put on a really good performance I mean I think he was the other guy he was the one guy out of that whole show to like that was the best I've ever seen him look and that was like my one fight where I was like oh wow that I'm actually much more impressed with you than I thought I would be yeah, I I picked uh, that was the fight where I went out on the limb and I picked uh, I picked filthy Rich Walsh. Yeah. Uh, and like and that fight went pretty much exactly how I thought it would. Yeah. Uh, like it, it, I, so I was I was very interested in that. But man, like that elbow that Joe Ban hit, that was awesome. And yeah. and props to Joe Ban because he like for he was an, always an older prospect. I don't think he had his first pro MMA fight until he was like twenty seven or twenty eight. Um, but, you know, he's really developed a, a, a nice and kind of complete game, uh, and, like, I mean, he is, he is just super fun. There are so many good matchups for him at 170, like, action fight matchups. Like, how much would you like to see him versus, uh, like, uh, the, like, the Alves Condit loser? Would that, would that not just be a ridiculously frickin' fun fight to watch? Like, for, I mean... He could be he could be the kind of dude like if you want to make a living as kind of a an anytime anywhere action fighter like Joe Ban could be really really good at that 
like he could he could make himself a lot of money uh, filling that role at 170. Yeah, I think I think we're missing one dude from this card. I think Tony Ferguson looked just freaking outstanding. Um, and I know he's been he's he's a little bit in terms of like career wise a little bit older fighter than we usually talk about. He's kind of right on that cusp. Uh, but I mean, you even even at least in Tebow, who's coming in on on somewhat short notice, like Tony Ferguson just handled him um, and absolutely ran circles around him on the ground and, and and put that choke on. I think Tony Ferguson's kind of he's hit that mark where it's like, all right, like he's legitimately like a top twenty lightweight at this point and needs to start getting like real serious guys across across from him in the cage. Um, so for me, he was like the guy that I really kind of had my woe moment. Um, Joe Bond would, would probably be my second, but for him, that was like he was the number one guy I walked away from, saying like, "There's a kind of like prospecty fighter that kind of had his breakthrough moment um, it, on this card." Yeah, I think I'm. Just, I I agree with that definitely. I was totally impressed by Tony Ferguson. He looked way way better than I thought I would. And Gla- than I thought he would. And Gleason Tebow has made his entire career out of coming in on low or on short notice to be like a ridiculously tough out for dude. So I don't really think that that you know like I don't see that as a real factor as much as it would be for a lot of fighters. Um and yeah, I mean, he's just kind of you know I'm I'm for the for the idea of prospect I'm basically done talking about Tony Ferguson. He's a top. 15 fighter. He's six years into his career. We should be seeing the best years of his career right now, and I think that's what we're starting to get. Yeah, I mean, Ferguson is almost like a poster child for the slow path of prospect development yeah. um, in, in kind of an interesting way. Like, it's taken him it's taken him a fairly long period of time to get to this point. Like, he was never on the Phenom track. Like, he didn't even win the Ultimate Fighter until, what, like four years into his career or something like that. Uh, three a little over over three years into his career, he's been slowed by injuries. He's had to, it's taken him a while to get to that place, but you can see the polish in his game. Like there's nothing that he doesn't know how to do. He can handle he can handle himself in every phase. He can handle himself in scrambles. He can handle himself in extended grappling situations. He can wrestle really. He can wrestle really well, both offensively and defensively. And he, I think, most importantly, um, and Tom, I, I, like. You, you were you were hinting at this when you talked about him running circles around Tebow on the ground, but the way that he did that was all uh, was always in spots where he had the advantage over Tebow. Like he never let himself get into a spot where like the matchup in that space favored Tebow at all. It was always in those transitional spaces where Ferguson was faster and more athletic and more explosive. So like it, I think it just like it was a good performance in that it showed a lot of self awareness in terms of what he was good at and what he wasn't. That maybe he didn't show when he fought Danny Castillo back last August. Yeah, he's he, it was definitely a, a a performance that now I want to just see him in top fifteen fights, and I you know I I assume that he will be a top ranked fighter for the next couple of years without any real question, you know. I got I got one more guy from 184 that that I would like to that I would like to talk about a little bit. By all means, Valmir Lazaro. Oh boy, yeah, yeah, no, of course. I told you, I told you. Yeah, uh, we got all. <laughs> we we got to soak that up a little because there were people who really thought that that I don't know I don't know what they thought they thought that uh, James Krause was somebody that he's not and that Valmir Lazaro was just a total can, and obviously he's not. Nope. Yeah, I mean, I think that people always underrate the the effect of coming into the, of making your debut on short notice uh, with, you know, I think Lazaro had like a week and a half or two weeks notice for that fight. Yep. Uh, it was a tough stylistic matchup for him, a uh, really tough stylistic matchup for him, uh, and, and yet he still threw a ridiculous amount of volume and, and put on... Like it wasn't a great performance, but it was a pretty good one. I thought mm-hmm. against Vic. I never understood that. Oh, he just looked sloppy and terrible. Line of reasoning, like with regard to that fight. Um, and you know, you got to feel for Kraus because he's kind of the quintessential quadruple A uh, athlete. Where like, <clears throat> for our listeners who don't know, this is a baseball term uh, to de- to denote somebody who is always crushes it at the upper levels of the minor leagues at triple A but just is not quite good enough to, to compete at the major league level. So, uh, like, Efrain Escudero, I would say, is another, like, quadruple-A kind of fighter. Um, Jacob Volkman, maybe, would, would also fall into that category. Um, 
but they're, they're just funny guys. UFC is full yeah. of them. Yeah, like well, Chris Chris Kamat, Chris Kamosi, uh, yeah. another kind of quadruple A guy. We're like they're just so much better than everybody that they're going to fight in the regionals, but they're not at a level to really compete with the with the elite at their at their weight. So uh, you got to feel for Kraus like that. But Lazaro Lazaro is one of the is one of the pure counter fighters. Mm-hmm. I think like. I think I've ever come across where like he's he's he can fight moving forward, but he's just so much so much happier when you're throwing at him and he can come back at you. Like that yeah. Connor, uh, that uh, Connor's test for uh, for a counter fighter is that they look half as good moving forward as they do fighting off their back foot, and I think that applies to Lazaro. Like Lazaro is clearly not comfortable leading, but he'll do it to win decisions. Like he knows he needs the yeah. work rate, which I think is kind of a mature thing to know about yourself as a fighter. Like. He's not going to risk losing a decision just because he hates moving forward. Yeah, I think I think Lazaro's defensive abilities got massively underrated coming into the Kraus fight. It was something that immediately stood out to me when I went back and watched his fight, uh, his debut in the lead up to to the Kraus fight, where it it was something I honestly didn't remember how sound he was defensively, and and yeah, the the lead up into it, just the the constant refrain that. Um, that he was this sloppy fighter that wasn't going to amount to anything, and Kraus was just going to run him over. Just seemed baffling, and it was it was very nice to see him get in there and 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 to make us look smart. So you know, internet fist bump, everybody. I I would love personally to see the UFC put on a round robin tournament between him and Alex Cowboy and Edson Barboza and Elias Silverio. And like all, and, oh, and Leonardo Mafra, and all the Brazilian Muay Thai lightweights that don't do anything other than like stand and bang Muay Thai. That would be pretty awesome. Just like find the best one. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's figure let's figure this out. I don't know. I uh, uh, the I just finished watching tape on on Alex Cowboy, and I'm sure we'll talk about him next week. But I was kind of impressed with him. I kind of enjoyed it. You, yeah, you no, I love that. Alex Cowboy. I, I would love to see him fight Valmir Lazaro. Can you imagine that fight? Like, <laughs> that would be great. Cowboy would be happy to lead, and Lazaro would be happy to counter, and we'd get something really fun out of it. Yeah, we would. Um, so, I, w- I want to talk briefly a little bit about sort of the other prospect research and you know other stuff going on. First of all couple of fights this weekend that I need to watch still, but for guys that I'm really happy to see win on Pacific Extreme Combat 47, which consistently seems to draw out a few really talented Asian prospects that are on their, like, that are going to go to the UFC, unlike 1FC, where you're like, oh, this guy's really good, and he's going to be locked into this dead-end sort of place for the rest of his career fighting total cans. Um... But Yusuke Yachi and Sebastian Kadistam both had knockout wins, both solid, both guys I expect to see in the UFC in short order. So that's very good news. Um, otherwise, we're just a rounding out our middleweight list, and it's been, I think, a little better than we thought it was. It was a real sl- I I didn't do a lot of it. I'll say up front. This has mostly been Tom's labor of love. Um, much like light heavyweight was sort of where I really buckled down and said, all right, I will slog through this shitty division for all of you. Tom has put on the boots and kicked around the turds of middleweight to uh, find what few gems there are. And we found a little more. We found more than I thought we would, I think. Yeah, I think it, it was surprising for me because I was expecting this to be just a barren wasteland. And while it didn't completely disappoint, um, there was some real awful MMA. Um, we found a couple guys, and now given some of them, I, I think mo- uh, there's a good portion of the notables, the like, you know, 30, 20 to 30 guys that we kind of marked as being notable fighters to go back and look at again. A good portion of them, if they ever make it to a higher level promotion, are likely going to be dropping a weight class. Some of them already are. Dropping a weight class, uh, I think uh, we have one or two of them. One of them, uh, Phil Hawes, I believe he tried to make welterweight for the Ultimate Fighter, or he was hoping they were going to have middleweights. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I know he is now with the Black Zillions. Um, he used to be a um, uh, Jackson Winklejohn fighter, um, and he he was one of the guys that immediately jumped out 
to both um, Zane and I in terms of athleticism and in terms of wrestling ability. Um, uh, I think I think our number one guy is it's it's a pretty easy call that it's Khalil Roundtree, um, just beastly athlete, um, really young in his pro career has only been fighting pro for about a year has a lot of amateur fights, um, and you can see the athleticism. There's been a huge stride in his striking ability uh, in the last couple of years. I mean, some of his early uh, amateur fights were just ugly, and his fights in the RFA have been. Honestly, he's looked really clean and crisp on the feet. Um, so I don't think it's a big shock that he's our number one guy. Yeah, it, it was nice. I, actually, I think this time, we've had this before. I think we had it for featherweight where we really had three guys at the top where we are like, oh, man, these three guys are just killers. Um, but that's, once again, what we have here where we've got three guys, I think, that are like these guys are going to be – top five fighters somewhere down the road and it's just a matter of time they're all really young in their career like within a year they're all really athletically talented they're already have really strong skills that put them way above the rank and file so I'm looking forward to publishing it and we'll be getting that out before long here as we put the finishing touches on it um, yeah, I think it's been interesting because I'm I'm not going to attempt to say his name because I would absolutely butcher it, but I think we have our first legitimate top 10 Polish prospect, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, a kid who can actually grapple pretty darn well um, and looks to be uh, looks to be a pretty, uh, like I said, really good athlete, very good grappler, is most likely going to end up fighting welterweight if he, if he makes it to the big time. Um, and uh, I, I can't say the name of the Russian kid that we we found or, or that we came across. Uh, we we put out a uh, we put out a gif of his of his pro debut of him slamming his opponent with a, a spinning uh, hook kick, and then and then actually being patient and letting the guy bounce back to his feet, not going absolutely nuts, and then finishing him in the clinch with just absolute murder knees, and. Um, the kid looks, and, and I mean, basically, he's fought two fights thus far. He he like debuted like in last fall, and and has knocked both his opponents out just absolutely brutally, and, and looks completely comfortable in MMA, like an absolute as Pat you would say, like just absolute MMA native. Just it does not seem lost at all in transition. Completely comfortable transitioning from striking to uh, to clinching to takedowns, and anytime there's any sort of like moment in between those, he's kneeing the crap out of you. So um, it, it's it's going to be a better list than expected, but oh boy, there was some bad, <laughs> there was some bad stuff in, in between finding these guys. Yeah, it did remind me a lot of the light heavyweight division, just in terms of the amount of like real chaff that there is in that division populating it as young prospects. So, but that, you know, that's how it is. I mean, at least we're... The, there's hope for future middleweight talent as as little of it as, as the UFC seems to have found lately. It seems to be a division much like light heavyweight where they 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 can't they couldn't find a, a potential top five contender to save their lives. But I think unlike light heavyweight, we've got some guys at the top that I could really you know not even just see contending down the road, but even possibly winning a belt, which. We couldn't say that about light heavyweight at all. Yeah. Well, one of the good things that this this search through middleweight has also yielded is that I've now determined that part of our mission as people who kind of watch tons of regional MMA to find prospects is that we now, like I am now making an effort to gif any weird regional MMA moments that happen and share them with people. Um, because you see some weird shit watching a lot of regional MMA. Um, I, I'm gonna put out the good, and then I'm gonna put out I'm gonna put out some of the bad. Um, one of the one of the Russian prospects we were looking at got his knee absolutely back, like the lower half of his leg turned backwards in a heel hook. Um, uh, so uh, there's a Polish fighter uh, who who absolutely killed a guy, knocked him flat unconscious, and the guy dropped to his knees and was kind of slumped on his knees. And, and then the guy just head kicked him, just completely blatantly got DQ'd, like trying to pump this dude's head out off while he was already unconscious. Just like you see some crazy shit that goes on in these shows. 
It's true. So we, people can look forward to that if they follow Tom on Twitter or me. He, if he if he shows it to me, I'll always be tweeting it out as well. Uh, and on that note, I think you know I don't think we have anything else we want to cover. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at these ain't Simon. You can find Tom on, on Twitter at tp underscore Grant. You can find Patrick on Twitter at Patrick underscore Wyman. You can find Patrick over at Shrewdog.com and Tom and I over at Bloody Elbow. Remember to give this video a like if you enjoyed it. That's the thumbs up button down there. Um, and other than that, stay tuned to MMANation.com. Subscribe. Lots more video shows, lots more interviews, lots more content, all sorts of shit. And, uh, you know, enjoy the fights this week.